Eschatology Lesson 7, Deceivers and Their Influence. So eschatology is the study of end time events, as we have broken down in Lesson 1, it's the study of last things. So two of the events prophesied about in the last days are the proliferation of deceivers and a subsequent apostasy. So two of the events prophesied about in the last days are the proliferation of deceivers, means the abundance, the multiplying of deceivers, and a subsequent apostasy. So in other words, the deceivers, there being a multiplication of them, they're going to bring deception and bring more apostasy to not just the body of Christ, but to a lot of people in general. So these prophesied events are taking place right now. These prophesied events are taking place right now, so we must study what the Bible says or has to say about them. So we need to know what the Word says so we can be accurate in understanding what is deception and what is not. Many of the body of Christ will be deceived not because somebody's just a good speaker. It's for a lack of the Word, a lack of knowing what the Word says for themselves. They'll go and say, well, that person's reading from the Bible So they must be preaching the truth. Well, no, 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 that doesn't necessarily mean that. The Nicolaitans, even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Nicolaitans took what God had said, took what the the disciples had said, what the apostles would say, what Jesus said, and perverted it, even right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is found all throughout the epistles of them addressing the Nicolaitan doctrine and calling it out, calling it out, calling it out, And even in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ calls it out and says, I hate that doctrine. I hate what those people do. Don't be like them. So for that to be, even from the resurrection of Jesus Christ about 96 AD when the book of Revelation was written, that's only 60 years roughly. So within that amount of time, for God to already have to address the Nicolaitan doctrine, that shows you that deception works quick. And it will pervert anything it can to keep people out of heaven, to keep people out of the will of God. So we've got to know the word for ourselves. I shouldn't be your walk with God. You should have your own walk with God. The word tells us that that we should walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. We walk out our own salvation. means it's up to us as an individual to have our own relationship with God. Amen. And I I will say, you will have as much of God as you want. You will have as much of God as you want. How you treat God is how it will be the basis, the foundation of your relationship with Him. Now, just maybe a minute example of what we're talking about. But in this, we as a church family, we all have a relationship with each other. For some, it's we all go to the same church. We love one another. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's about as far as it goes. But for others, one may be mother and son relationship. One may be a husband and wife relationship. One may be spiritual father, spiritual child relationship. Some may be, you know, son and and father or whatever the case may be because there's a lot of different relationships. But that intimacy of each of those relationships is based on how much time and how much effort they put into that relationship. Not just that they're blood related, Because we're related to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, making us joint heirs with Jesus. But we should have that personal relationship that we keep working out and walking out each and every day with our God. And having that relationship, knowing what the Word says, having our own prayer time will help us to not fall for the deception that the enemy wants to put in front of our face. Amen. So deceivers. Deceptions are lies interwoven And mixed with truth. I want to say that again. Deceptions are lies interwoven and mixed with truth. I I think I've heard Pastor Chris say it. I also heard Dr. Barclay say it. It, Deception is like one of those things where you have, like, like a, we'll make it like a sandwich. I think one of them compares it to a cookie, the other one compares it to a sandwich. I, I forget which one's which. But you have like this slice of bread or me, I like Oreos, so we'll go with an Oreo. You have the bottom layer that's a wafer that's like the truth of God. And then you have all of this cream filling. Because really the wafer is not what puts fat on you. It's the middle cream that's in there. 
That's the reason you have your stuff. Do you have your double stuff? Do you have your triple stuff? You have all of this stuff that's just fattening. So the more stuff, stuffing that you put in it, the more fattening it's going to be, the worse it is for you. Now, I'm preaching a lot better than y'all are amen and already. Because the wafer, because then you, what do you do? You, you've got to top it off with another wafer. So you got truth, you got fluff, and then you got truth. This middle part is what makes the rest of this deception. Because as we can see, deception are lies interwoven, mixed with truth. So you got a little bit of truth, put a lot of fluff, a lot of junk that's going to hinder your healthy relationship with God and put some more truth on top of it to make it like a perfect sandwich. That's what's palatable for people. Because really, at the end of the day, people are going to want to eat, we'll say, an Oreo over a healthy sandwich. It's, we'll say, rye bread with some healthy meat, with some lettuce and tomatoes, with maybe a, you know, a little bit of mustard on there because mustard doesn't have many calories to it. You have a healthy sandwich like that. What, what's people going to choose? You set out a, a big, juicy Oreo and a healthy sandwich like that. Which one are people going to choose? They're going to choose the Oreo because they know the sweetness. that Oh, that tastes better. That's more palatable. I can, I can handle that better than I can the healthy sandwich. But which one's more healthy for you? The sandwich. The sandwich that's going to build your muscle, keep you from getting fat, keep you from getting lazy, keep you from having this sluggish mentality of just falling asleep in the things of God. Eating that healthy sandwich will give you energy to burn to say, Father, I'm ready for your return. I'm ready for the return of Jesus Christ at any moment. I don't feel sluggish because I haven't been feasting on deception and lies to make me fall asleep in the things of God. I've been feasting on the healthiness to have energy to burn, to have energy to spare for the house of God, for the kingdom of God, to see people born again. Amen. Amen. So deceptions are lies interwoven and mixed with truth. But how do you know what the deception is? Unless you know the word of God. Amen. (laughs) Nick and I were just talking about how we could take this like this Bible that, that he just found, that it's a journaling Bible. I've seen a few of them. There's nothing wrong with that. But we were joking about how we could write on the sides. We could write our own version of Jesus. We could write our own version of the Bible just out there beside of it and just mark out what the Word says. But that, that we say that as a joke, but many people do that. And others are none the wiser. They don't understand. You could get up and preach Jesus as a hippie. He had long hair, long beard, just loved on everybody. Just went around healing people. And people received that. Was that true? Yes, Jesus healed people. Yes, Jesus had long hair. Jesus had a beard. Jesus had all these things that were going for him of what they're saying. But was he a hippie Jesus that just loved on everybody and didn't rebuke anybody? That's the deception. Because what he did do is he, out of love, he did love on everybody, but he rebuked those that were wrong. So, but with that little sliver of deception mixed in with all that truth, people say, oh, that's right. Jesus did go around loving on everybody. Jesus did go around healing people. Jesus did do this. Jesus did do that. And then they don't catch the deception of that he just loved on everybody and didn't confront anybody. That's a deception. But that's what you'll hear in, in many modern churches. Of Jesus just loves everybody. Yes, he does. But that also institutes a rebuke and correction when it's needed. Amen. Jesus said, matter of fact, Scripture Scripture, you know, the thing that most churches want to leave out now, the Bible, all of the Bible, not just the little cherry pick verses. When it says, I rebuke and I chastise those that I love, that means I correct, I get on to the ones I love. Why? Because he doesn't want you dying and going to hell because you don't know what the word says, because you don't know what God really expects of you. Amen. You know, a good boss is going to lay out his instructions, his guidelines for you constantly, 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 constantly. And then a good supervisor, we'll say, we'll say the boss is like the main guy. A good supervisor is going to constantly remind you, hey, the boss doesn't want it done that way. Hey, the boss doesn't want it done that way. This is the way to do it. This is the way. Good job. You've done that correctly. Good job. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now you messed this up. Well, let's correct this. Let's fix this because that's not the way it needs to be done. The boss doesn't like that. That's not the product that we sell. That's not how we want that done. We need to do it like this. We can see how that goes with the things of God. God being the boss wants things done a certain way by his book, by his manual. A good supervisor would be a good pastor, a good spiritual leader, even a brother and sister in Christ who can speak into your life to say, oh, no, come on now. 
you know, we, we know what the word says. We need to fix that. We don't live our life like that. That's not the product that he wants displayed as his quality. He wants a good quality. We've got to be able to do what the handbook says for us to, to have good quality to represent the boss well, to represent his company well. I'm not trying to sell God, but hopefully we're picking up what I'm laying down of we're to live our life pleasing unto God. Our quality may not be 100% within us, but with God and his mercy and his grace, our quality is 100% because we keep going to the QA office and saying, God, what's wrong with me? Help me, fix me, correct me. Whatever you need to adjust, fix me and help me, God, because I want to be 100% in your eyes. Amen. But with, that, with, but with deception, it's like, well, there's no need to go to the QA office. There's no need for me to fix that. There's no need for me to fix this. Because you've gotten the lies interwoven mixed with the truth. In deception, there are enough elements of truth to make it palatable to the unstable and naive soul. Deceivers are masters at mixing perversion with truth to beguile the innocent. Deceivers are masters at it. <laughs> I actually saw a gentleman yesterday that is a de- he's a master at deception. And... <laughs> uh, this was probably maybe a little bit of a bitter pastor because this person has spewed his venom and to some people I know, things of that nature. But when I saw him yesterday, I asked him if he was still listening to demons. And he laughed at me and kind of trying to figure out what I was saying. And I just smiled at him. I thought, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he tried to smooth it over because there was other people around. And I'm like, I don't care, dude. You are listening to demons. When you tell people to back off of the house of God, when you tell people to, to leave the house of God and to, you still going to that church? You still this? You still that? That's the, a deceiver. And they're masters at it. They're masters at it because they make you feel like you're the one that's stupid. They make you feel like you're the one that's out of sorts. They may, may make you feel like you're the one that is all just confused and not the sharpest knife in the drawer. No, no, no. That's a master of deception, and that is somebody that is given into a demon. That's where this stuff comes from. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. So if you speak to somebody and you feel this confusion coming over you, you might, might want to back away from that person because they're a master deceiver. And all they want to do is breed confusion. They don't want you to speak a lie. They just want you to believe a lie. <laughs> but deception is not a threat to the heathen world. Deception is not a threat to the heathen world. Why? Because they're already giving in to the things of the enemy. They're not having to be pulled away from God. They are of their father, the devil. Deception is an assault on Christians. Deception is an assault on Christians. Why do you think that some people, when they, when they hear that you're a Christian or you go to a church, you know, unless it's like one of those fluffy churches you know, that love to sell you the Oreo puff, fluff and cream, unless it's one of those, if it's a really good church, it's going to give you the healthy sandwich. Why do you think that many of those churches will go to you and, or many of those people will say, you still going to that church? And as soon as you say yes or no, why do you think they start harassing you? <laughs> By that same guy, I was nicknamed St. Andrews. I, I wear that as a badge of honor. Because apparently your preacher is not a saint. He's a sinner like everybody else. And because your preacher won't preach the word of God and convict you, then you want to call me out. I'll call you out, buddy. I don't care. I'm going to come and preach the word of God. What you say doesn't matter to me. It's actually a badge of honor to me to say, hey, at least somebody knows I have a standard. <laughs> and just in case that guy's listening, in case he ever goes back and listens, I don't care if he does or not. Just in case he, I have a standard. Up yours. Up your standard. Because obviously your standard is not to God's standard, so you need to repent and make things right. Anyway. <laughs> false ministers. False ministers. The Bible speaks of several different kinds of false ministers. By definition, they are deemed false because they appear to be genuine and they pass themselves off as genuine, but they are in fact counterfeit. They are counterfeit. Counterfeit means not sincere doesn't just mean it's fake. It's not sincere. There are many Christians that are counterfeit. They're not sincere about their walk with God. 
They are not sincere about what they do for the kingdom of God. All they care about is having the appearance and deny the power. They're not sincere. Counterfeit also means an imitation. Now here's the one I found really interesting. Counterfeit means forged to deceive. It's intended. Its whole purpose is to be forged, to be made to deceive others. (laughs) So false ministers are counterfeit. They are forged to deceive others. Their destruction effectiveness is based on their ability to pass themselves off as the real deal. These false offices include false prophets. We can see scripture there. False teachers. See scripture there. False pastors. We can see scripture for there. False Christ means false Christians, we could also say. And then false apostles, we can see scripture there. Notice that the only one of the fivefold missing is evangelist. (laughs) We'll get to that in a moment. False brethren, we can see scripture for that. Note there is no mention of a false evangelist in the Bible. It seems that adhering to simple evangelism will keep you safe. Because if you're evangelizing, you're telling people about Jesus. You're telling people about God. You're telling people the good news of how they can be born again. So the enemy doesn't want to promote that. So he's going to say, let's, let's fake all the rest of them. Let's counterfeit all the rest of them. But we can't fake that one. Because if we try to fake that one, we're going to lead people to Christ. We're going to lead people to God. So let's not fake that one. Let's fake the rest of them. <laughs> Successful deceivers. Jesus does not want his people deceived. Praise God. However, he promised it would happen to some believers. This is why it's important for us to know the word, to walk out our own salvation in fear and trembling, to walk with our God each and every day, that we stay away from this deception. We stay away from the falsities of the enemy. Three times in Matthew 24, Jesus warns us of deceivers and false Christ. So Matthew 24, 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, I am anointed, and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 11, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 23 and 24 says, there if any, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So we can see three times out of Matthew 24 alone. Just just that, that book and chapter alone, three times Jesus warns against this. These deceivers will target the church and will be somewhat successful. Somewhat. That somewhat depends on you and your relationship with God. So that's the reason that, especially living in these last days, I don't know if you've turned on the news lately. I don't know if you've been paying attention to everything that's going on. Everything around us is getting more corrupt and more corrupt and more corrupt. So we need to be looking to the sky to say, all right, Jesus, I know you're coming back at any moment. I'm not looking for an escape clause. I'm just looking for Jesus Christ to come back, and I want to be ready whenever that is. If it's tomorrow, if it's 10 years from now, if it's 20 years from now, I'm just getting ready because I know it could happen at any moment. And I'm just walking out my salvation in fear and trembling, saying, all right, God, I'm ready. I want to walk with you. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to give in to the enemy and be confused and lied to. I just want to walk with you. So we cannot stop them. So these deceivers will target the church and be somewhat successful. We cannot stop them. We cannot stop these deceivers because they are supposed to be there. They are part of what is to come and what is already here. What we can stop is them from deceiving us. You can't really control somebody else. (laughs) That's like for me, one one of the first lessons that I had to learn as a pastor is I can't control people. Not that I was trying to mind control, but I would try to give the word and I would try to help people get out of the mess they were in, try to help give, them, give the word to them to get them out of the muck and the mire, to try to give them a helping hand, try to give them a ladder, rope, however you want to say that, try to help them out of their situation and not trying to control them, but trying to help them, they would reject it. They would either knock over the ladder or slap my hand or burn the rope or however you want to say it. They'd just try to get rid of everything that I was trying to do to help them. So I had to learn real quick, 
Not everybody wants help. Not everybody wants the truth. Not everybody wants out of deception. Not everybody wants out of the muck and mire. And those are the people that will love, love the deception because it makes them feel good as they're on their way to hell. There will be many, and they will deceive many. That's talking about the false ministers. There will be many, and they will deceive many. This can and will affect people we know. This can and will affect people we know. We must watch and pray and study the word to ensure that we are not part of the many. Amen. A apostolic witness. Paul, John, and Peter all bore witness to the wicked ministry of these deceivers and spoke of how they will operate. So they spoke of this. They bore witness. It means they all were able to tell of this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They all bore witness to it of this wicked ministry of these, of these deceivers and spoke to how they were operate. So, in other words, the Holy Spirit gave Paul, John, and Peter the insight of what to write down, how to, not only for us, but for the believers that they wrote to, as we're about to see from these various scripture, but not only for the, those that they wrote to, but also for us. So it's like vice versa. To help us understand these are the symptoms, or these are the characteristics of wicked ministry, of deceivers, things of that nature. So this is what you look out for. So when you see these things, beware, be leery. So Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves. Now that's not talking about animals, because he says, after my departing. He's talking about when I leave, when I go out of here, when I leave with my apostolic anointing and ministry, I know as soon as I do, there's going to be these deceivers, there's going to be these wolves that come in, not sparing the flock. That means they're going to bite anybody they can, they're going to take out anybody they can, they're going to harm and hurt anybody they can, they're going to try to maim and lame and kill as many as they can. Because why? Because the enemy comes to still kill and destroy. That's exactly what he wants to do. So if that's the enemy's purpose, we would say Satan then those that are of him, because we know that Satan is a father to some, because even Jesus Christ looks at some of them and says, you are of your father the devil. And he's actually talking to religious people. Anyway, another message for another time. But he says here that grievous wolves will enter in, not sparing the flock. Then he says, also of your own selves shall men arise. So wolves, we could say, come from outside to come in. But he even gives the warning here, also of your own selves men shall arise. That means people within the church will arise. Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So wolves enter in, of our own men will arise to do what? To draw away. Notice, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. It's all about pride. It's all about selfishness. At the end of the day, the grievous wolves and the people that arise from within all want the attention on themselves. This is why I'm mindful of lukewarm churches and lukewarm pastors, lukewarm Christians in general, but especially those that are all about drawing people unto themselves. Because that lets me know, how much are you willing to compromise to gather people? That happens a lot more than what we realize. Even since I've been a pastor, I've maybe kept on more, more tabs on just kind of the heartbeat of the region of what's going on. And even in my almost three years of pastoring, I've seen churches go from walking really good for God, walking really good with God or for God, however you want to say it, preaching the truth, maybe not even maybe not our flavor and not, not just because a church is not our flavor doesn't mean they're not going to, to heaven. <laughs> there are denominations that believe that. That's not me. But we know that every church is going to have a different flavor because not everybody's the same. So God's going to call people to different churches to help build that ministry. One may have 
a different ministry of helping feed the, feed the homeless or feed the poor. The other one may have, be there to help have a deliverance ministry of people that are coming off drugs, things of that nature. Some may be another ministry, maybe youth-oriented, or whatever the case may be. But with that, those ministries, I've seen a, a few of them, even in our region, that have went from doing what God has called them, having you know, pretty good reputation of honoring God, pretty good word coming from the pulpit, and because no church is perfect, but having that kind of reputation and being that kind of fruit, which is probably a better word, having that fruit to all of a sudden within just my time of pastoring now becoming more lukewarm, more entertainment driven. And I'm thinking, where in the world did you start compromising? Where in the world did you start compromising? And I don't want it to seem like I'm running other churches down because just as easily as maybe others that we've noticed do that, God forbid we could too. God forbid we could too. We could, but we could do that, but that's the reason it's so vital and so important for each and every one of us to be able to go to the Word and say, what does the Word say? How should we do this? What, what is the standard that God holds that we should hold? Not just what does the pastor say, or that would fit good in culture. No, no, no. What does God say? Amen. It's one of those things to where I would, I would dare say, if you see me going against this word, leave. If you see me going against the word of God and what it stands for, leave. Amen. I would, I would also ask that maybe you bring it to my attention before you leave, so maybe help me make it right, but I don't intend on ever doing that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. But, we're, but people are human. So just as I don't really want to run down other brothers that I've seen that have moved in that direction or compromised things, but it is one of those where you're like, what, what, what happened? What, where was the change? What made you think that compromising would gather more people and that's the will of God? Anyway, 2 Timothy 3.13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2 says, But there were false prophets among, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who probably shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So we can see even Peter saying, there's going to be false, there were false prophets among the people. There shall be false teachers among you. They're going to bring these heresies. They're going to deny the Lord that bought them. That sounds like today's time. But this is Peter speaking as well for their time. And bring them to them unto themselves swift destruction. Swift destruction. Here's usually the pattern that you can watch. Somebody loves God, serves God. We'll, we'll just take a pastor, just because that's usually the ones that catch the most, most heat or most attention. We'll say a pastor has a church, maybe was sent out, done, doing it biblically, and then they raise up, they start preaching the, the gospel, the church starts growing, starts doing things. All of a sudden, somewhere along the lines, compromise is made, the church explodes, now you go from just growing the church to now all of a sudden it explodes to major popularity. And then within a few years, you'll find out very quick something will be exposed of the sexual immorality, drunkenness, ex exploitation of minors, something of financial immorality, something of that nature was, was going on behind the scenes and now all of a sudden that church just tanks. That's usually the pattern that happens when you see churches that go from doing what God has called them to, to all of a sudden the mindset gets to, well, let's just get, let's gather people, and that will have to be the will of God, because if we have more people and we read the Scripture, then all of a sudden it's, it's, it has to be God. It has to be God. Not counting for the devil knows Scripture too. So just reading a couple of verses doesn't make you a Christian. Walking with God makes you a Christian. That's why it's important for us to never walk away from our walk with God. So 1 John 4, 1 and 5 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, 
whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. So there are many false prophets that are gone out into the world. That's the reason we're to try the spirits, to test the spirits. Where did this come from? (laughs) It's easy to say where something comes from if you favor it. If you favor it and it makes you feel good, well, that's from God. That's from God. (laughs) We'll go back to our Oreo analogy. If if this demon says, you need to eat a whole pack of Oreos, okay, yes, that's got to be from God because he wants me to stuff my belly. He wants me to feel so full. He wants me to be full. Thank you, God, for wanting me to be full. Now, you think that would be from God? No, because God says, have self-control. Amen. There we go. Praise God. (laughs) Have self-control. That doesn't mean you can't eat a couple Oreos at a time. Not that the Oreos are sin, but the gluttonous attitude and that spirit telling you, hey, you can indulge yourself in this. You can indulge yourself. You don't need to have self-control. Just partake of the whole thing. That's where we can get into sin. Because we'll we'll take sex. Sex is not a bad thing. But if a demon's telling you to use sex and you're not married, that makes it sin. But if a, if a spirit says, hey, when you marry this person, you can make love to your spouse as often as you want to. Hey, that's of God because that's biblical. We're married. We're making love to each other. Hey, praise God. But when you take the right thing and out of context and use it wrong then that's going to not be a spirit from God. That's going to be a spirit from the world that's trying to get you to pervert something that seems right. Amen. So Paul predicted that the church would, the church would see wolves come in from the outside and perverse speakers would, would arise from within to pull people away. Peter prophesied that false teachers were coming. They are here and they purposefully Shuffle in destructive errors. They shuffle in destructive errors. These teachers are producing doctrines that appeal to carnal flesh and successfully teach and promote subtle rebellion against the spirit of truth. I'm going to read that again. These teachers are producing doctrines that appeal to carnal flesh and successfully teach and promote subtle rebellion against the spirit of truth. That's like, I don't know if we talked about it last week or not. That's, uh, there's a preacher who recently said, well, you know, you can drink as long as you don't drink in front of others that causes them to stumble. Uh, I don't think that's what the Word says. The Word says when it begins to move about itself in the cup, it means it begins to ferment. Don't even look upon it. Wine is a mocker. And so that is a mindset of, well, as long as you don't do it, make others stumble. So in other words, you can say, you can trip yourself up, just don't trip anybody else up. That's what's really being said. Stick your own foot in front of yourself to make yourself fall, but as long as you don't trip anybody else, you'll be all right. That's stupid. That's spiritual retardation. <laughs> These teachers are producing doctors. I'm going to read it again just because I feel like punching this spirit of religiosity right in the mouth. These teachers are producing doctrines that appeal to carnal flesh and successfully teach and promote subtle rebellion against the spirit of truth. So how deceivers operate? We need to make sure that we keep a hold of this lesson, if for nothing else, for this right here. How deceivers operate? Number one, they come in the name of Jesus. Matthew 24, 5. Well, that's not a bad thing. No. Because if they said, we come in the name of the devil, then you would say, oh, eh, no, wrong answer. Nope, out of here. That, that wouldn't be deception. That would be truthfulness. Which would probably, <laughs> they, would, they would sell themselves short of what they really came to do. So they come in the name of Jesus. They arise from within the church. This denotes they start in obscurity and rise to a grand place of prominence and influence. Oh, you mean like some of the people that run for president. They just, before the presidential race, I had never heard of Barack Obama. Other people may have, had, but somebody had to vote for him to get him up to where he was before he became a, a, a official for, that was running for president. But honestly, I'd never heard of him. There's been different people throughout time. I'm like, where did this person, I've never heard of this person. There's, they've been this long in 
and politics and d- different stuff. Now, some of that is maybe neglectful for me because I don't keep up with every state and every person that runs. If I got that kind of time, I'm obviously laying something down for God because I'm not paying attention to what God wants me to do, paying attention to that. Anyway, but with that, we can see, the reason I bring that up is this denotes they start in obscurity and arise to a place, a grand place of prominence and influence. It means they almost like come out of nowhere and they're just lifted up into this esteem of a place of authority or a place of influence. So they are, all, they are most effective on national and international platforms. We can see that from Matthew and from Acts. They can demonstrate signs and wonders. It's got to be God. It's a sign and wonder. Well, if I'm not mistaken, there were some of the things even in Exodus when Moses and Aaron would do a miracle or do something to show the Pharaoh that they meant business, they were on assignment from God, that even the Pharaoh's people would try to mock and imitate what God had done. Like the serpent. Moses lays down his his rod and becomes a snake. And then the magicians, the Pharaoh's people, they do the same thing, but Moses' stick eats, eats their snake. His snake eats their snake. And then turns back into a rod. That shows that God's going to have the final word. God's going to have the final say. But these miracles and signs and wonders, things of that nature, these people can do the same. Because they're going to imitate, because they're on assignment from the devil, they're going to imitate the things of God. They stealthily, subtly, and purposefully, or purposely bring in damnable heresies. We can see that from Acts and 2 Peter. They stealthily, means they fly under the radar, they subtly and purposely, they do it with a purpose, but they're stealthy and subtle. <laughs> they bring in these damnable heresies. They merchandise the people of God, viewing them as merely a dollar sign because as enemies of the cross, they mind earthly things. So they merchandise the people of God. Oh, you mean bringing more people in so that they can buy more merch. They can buy more things. They can give more money. (laughs) That's when you see people as a dollar sign and not the sheep of God. Because as enemies of the cross, they mind earthly things because they're more focused on gaining more money than they are winning souls for Christ. They are of the world and comfortably hobnob with worldly people. They are of the world and comfortably hobnob with worldly people. True preachers fellowship in the light and are uncomfortable around worldly settings. <laughs> I, take, I usually take note of those that are uncomfortable around me and a couple of other preachers. I take note of that. Whether it's in, whether I'm like here in our region or whether I'm in another state with another group of believers or another group of pastors or ministers, I take note of that because if you can't be comfortable with some of us, then what, what's, if, if I know I'm not perfect by any means and some of the other gentlemen that I run with, they're not perfect either, but if we're doing our best to serve God, why are you uncomfortable around us? That's a telltale sign of something's off. Something's not adding up. What was that old... Children's, children's song, one of these things is not like the other. It's like, hmm, something's off. <laughs> and if we're not uncomfortable around that person, why is that person uncomfortable around us? Anyway, again, not that we have it all figured out, but you can see a pattern. They have a form of godliness, but they divorce themselves from the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3, 5. They have a form, but they deny the power. They deny the They divorce themselves from the power thereof. They divorce the relationship. They resist the truth because their minds are corrupted. 2 Timothy 3.8 So this is how deceivers operate. They resist the truth. Why? Because the truth would expose them. The truth would expose them for who they really are. They use grace as an excuse to sin and feel no remorse. Jude 4 Man, that's like... That Joseph Prince guy, he's just, he's just the master at that. No, that was a Nicolaitan doctrine. So the same spirit that spoke to the Nicolaitans spoke to Joseph Prince, who now is the hyper-grace guru, and now many others are following suit. 
And I don't mind calling him out by name because he's not ashamed of it. He feels no need to repent. Because <laughs> grace will cover it. <laughs> but they use grace as an excuse to sin and feel no remorse. It's my personal, my personal conviction. This is my pastor writing it, but I stand in, agree, in agreement with him. It's my personal conviction that very few false ministers start off false. Very few of them do. They don't determine, you know what? Hmm, I think I'm going to be a false preacher. No, no they, don't, they don't do that. They said in themselves, I'm going to serve God. And somewhere along the way, the world, the spirit of the world ministers them, speaks to them. They don't override it. They give in to it. And then all of a sudden, things start exploding. Things start going really well and really smooth for them because they gave in to the compromise. I would rather fight uphill going both ways for the God than to let it be a downhill ride with the enemy. <laughs> I believe they start off genuine and eager to build the kingdom, but later succumb to temptations, buffetings, and the workings of familiar spirits. 1 Timothy 4.1 However, the Bible is very clear about false ministers. They are no longer God's ministers. They are no longer God's ministers. This is the reason that I have a list that we don't allow certain ministers to have books, videos, DVDs, whatever. I don't, uh, everything in our library, this is the reason I have a list of things that we do not allow. People that we do not allow. Even Christian groups we do not allow. We don't allow them in our library. Why? Because I don't want our people and our church feasting on people that are not of God. So let's read this again. However, the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear about it, about false ministers. They are no longer God's ministers. When they become false, then they are no longer God's ministers. There are some people who we used to have in the library, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll say they've been around for a while. So maybe in the 90s, or very early 2000s, they were really good. They were preaching, teaching the Word. But... Maybe from that point to presently, they've become heretics. They've started preaching other doctrines or whatever the case may be. As, I, as that stuff comes to light, I go back and I'm constantly looking at our library and I wipe out anything. I don't care from what year it is. If it's even from the 90s when they were you know, in pretty good doctrinal stances, I will still take it out because we can't pinpoint when did they allow this compromise to start in their life so that should let us know we need to stick close to our God that we're not deceived we don't allow these deceptions in our lives because if we do God forbid then if we've been witnessing and evangelizing to somebody we'll say on the job because maybe that's where you see somebody quite regularly but they don't have that intimate relationship with you outside the workplace anyway if, they, if we allow that deception and all of a sudden we start saying something false or something that's off kilter, that coworker we've been evangelizing and witnessing to, and they say, well, wait a minute. And you used to tell me that the Word says this, and I've been studying that because you told me that. And now I find that that doesn't line up. What you're saying now doesn't line up with the Word. What are they instantly going to do? They're going to dump everything that we have said all of those years, all of that evangelism, all that witnessing. I can't trust them now, so I guess I can't trust anything they've ever told me. <laughs> Just like a marriage. When you break a marriage covenant, now with God, things are possible to restore that relationship. But it is very hard to restore that. Because once trust has been broken, the enemy's always going to be there in the mind of the spouse that was faithful to say, that person lied to you once, are they doing it again? That person lied to you once, are they doing it again? And that, that voice will always be there. No matter how many times you shut it up, you know at some there's a sliver of truth in what that enemy is saying. That's the reason not only do we need to be holy and clean in our marriages, we need to be holy and clean in everything that we say and do. So the enemy has no foothold in our life, which is what Ephesians 4 tells us. Don't give any place for the devil. But going back to our false ministers, they become Satan's ministers, or they have become Satan's ministers. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... 
For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end is according to their works. So even going back to the gentleman that I saw yesterday, I kind of called him out. It's one of those things where he can pass himself off as very spiritual. But it's not a godly spiritual, it's a demonic spiritual. But he's very slick because he can pass himself off as an angel of light. (laughs) That's what we've got to be leery of. That's why we test the spirits, we try the spirits. You'll know really quick when you start trying it if it's it's of God or not. Because the enemy won't like that testing because it's not pure and true. It's like when you go to take gold to somebody, you're going to try, somebody's trying to sell you a piece of gold, and you say, all right, or right, we'll take a diamond. We're going to take this diamond, I'm going to buy this from you, but first I'm going to have it tested. No, 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 you don't need to do that. You have my word, it's true. You have my word, it's a pure diamond. And then all of a sudden you take it to the tester, you take it to the jewelry person, and they test it. No, 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 this is fake. This is fake. It looks good, but it's fake. Then that person selling it to you, they're going to get offended. Why? Because you've, You've sought them out. You've called them out. You've proven what they were trying to sell you was fake. The enemy won't stand for that. The enemy cannot stand. Why? Because they resist the truth. (laughs) The end result. Many carnal and lukewarm Christians are successfully finding carnal and heretical preachers to lead them in their lukewarm and damnable lifestyle. We'll read that again. Many carnal and lukewarm Christians are successfully finding carnal and heretical preachers to lead them in their lukewarm and damnable lifestyle. This is all the work of the spirit of Antichrist. Not just anti-Jesus, anti-Christian. The carnal church will look for a leader and behold, one will arise and lead them into apostasy. This is the great falling away. <laughs> 